Hello class, uh, today we're going to be talking about the Constitutional Convention, the Federalist Papers, and the Bill of Rights. Um, so to begin, uh, the Constitutional Convention took place from May 14th to September 17th in 1787 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The point of the event was to decide how America was going to be governed, essentially. Um, the Articles of Confederation, as we all know, uh, were failing uh, to effectively govern the country. Um, and uh, many of the delegates, you know, who were going to this uh, constitutional convention, which I'll call CONCON from now on, uh, to be a little bit shorter and easier. Um, so the, the delegates attending CONCON uh, were there to, you know, revise the existing Articles of Confederation, but many of them had bigger plans uh, to actually completely replace the document. Um, so the uh, first person we're going to talk about is James Madison um, of Virginia, who arrived in Philadelphia 11 days early and determined to set the convention's agenda before uh, the con so So he's determined to set the convention's agenda. So before the convention, Madison studies uh, republics and confederacies throughout history, such as ancient Greece, uh, Rome, contemporary Switzerland, uh, and in April 1787, prior to the convention, he drafts this document titled Vices of the Political System of the United States, um, which essentially systematically goes through the various aspects of our political system at the time, the Articles of Confederation, and offers varying solutions uh, for what he determines are its weaknesses. Um, and he's not alone in thinking that uh, this document has many weaknesses, obviously, at this point. Um, so due to his advanced preparation, uh, Madison's blueprint for the constitutional revision became kind of the starting point, uh, the starting line for the convention's deliberations. Um, and today we refer to this as the Madison blueprint. Um, so at the constitutional convention, there were a lot of major issues that were, um, discussed and that kind of essentially really brought to a head the the difference in you know the differences of opinions between the larger states and the smaller states um so one of the biggest issues uh that really divides you know the large states and small states is this issue of representation um large states obviously want uh representation based off of population uh whereas the small states want an equal representation for each state you know makes sense based on you know what what they're looking for they're all you know trying to look after their best interests essentially right so we have this thing happen called the great compromise um where it essentially we get both and that's what you see in our political system today with the congress being broken up into the house of representatives and the senate uh, we have two senators for each state, and then the House of Representatives is determined off of population of states. Um, so I believe at this time it was every 30,000 uh, people uh, gave you one delegate uh, or one representative in the House of Representatives. Obviously, that number has changed a great deal since this time as our population is much larger. Um, but that was, you know, kind of the basis of it. Um, so... We have this great compromise, which kind of allows the large states and the small states to be happy um, and proceed through past that roadblock. Um, another roadblock discussed is essentially the roles of state versus federal government and, you know, what each uh, aspect of government is going to have control over. So, um, you know, we, we have these people that are obviously pushing for a stronger federal government like Hamilton, like Madison. Um, but, you know, there's also detractors from this, obviously. So uh, the many of the delegates, you know, the, they want the state government to be, you know, the ipso facto. Um, and they're afraid of a federal government, you know, that's going to oppress its citizens. Obviously, they just threw off the yoke of, you know, oppression of, of the English government. Um, so that they don't want to just jump back into bed with a new monarch. So they there a lot of... Uh, them are wary of a strong federal government. Um, and this compromise that they reach is kind of, they allot specific responsibilities to the federal government and then everything else that's not specified is left to the state governments. Um, so that's the compromise that they reach on this issue. Um, speaking of major issues, slavery is another huge issue uh, that is discussed throughout the Constitutional Convention, CONCON. -Con. Um, 
And obviously the word slavery does not appear in the constitution, but it's very central to the debates going on, um, especially over uh, commerce and representation. Um, the Southern states want their slaves to count towards their population for determining how many, you know, uh, representatives they get in the House of Representatives. Um, the, you know, Northern states are not really on board with this. Uh, you know, a lot of Northern states are, you know, actually pushing towards ab uh, abolition, but, you know, it's, it's obviously not going to happen at this point in history. Um, it's, it's, I, I think they, they just knew that they couldn't get the Southern states to join a country where they were going to outlaw slavery. So they reached this other compromise. This compromise is called the three fifths compromise where 60% of enslaved people in each state are going to count towards their representation, despite the fact that they can't vote um, and, you know, hold land and they're not free citizens. Uh, the Constitutional Convention also debates whether to allow the new federal government uh, to ban the importation, not the buying and selling in the country, but the importation of slaves from other countries uh, outside of the United States. Um, and they ultimately reach this compromise where they're not going to let the federal government do anything right now, but in 20 years, they're going to allow them to... Um, ban the importation, so the international slave trade. Um, and in 1808, the United States does just that, 20 years after the uh, ratification of the, uh, the Constitution. So uh, as I said, we're reaching all these great compromises, but the end result is that uh, the Constitution does not get ratified, right? So we have 55 delegates from 12 states attending, and at least nine of the states uh, have to vote you know, a majority to ratify it. Um, we do not get that. We have big holdups, um, big holdouts in Massachusetts, New York, Virginia. These are all very large states that carry a lot of weight um, at this time. Uh, you know, pretty much all of the major states outside of uh, Pennsylvania are, are not on board. Um, so despite the progress that's made during the months of the convention, once the Constitution is completed, they can't get the votes they need. And this leads to uh, the writing of the Federalist Papers. Um, the Federalist Papers are written by John Jay, James Madison, uh, who we discussed earlier, and of course, Alexander Hamilton. And as you can guess, they are, you know, in favor of the Constitution. They're in favor of a stronger uh, federal government. Um, and these papers are written, uh, you know, these essays are written essentially to try to convince the American people to support this new Constitution, because if the American people support it, um, then they will tell their delegates to support it, right? And you win the people, you win the popular vote, right? So uh, next we are going to watch a quick excerpt from uh, Hamilton, uh, reanimated though, um, because uh, it's on YouTube.
All right, so uh, moving on, as you uh, can tell by the um, by the uh, video there, um, there were 85 Federalist Papers written. John Jay wrote five, um, James Madison 29, and Alexander Hamilton a whopping 51 of these essays uh, defending the Constitution, uh, trying to rally people to uh, support it. So impressive work. Um, and these Federalist Papers really, you know, they, they help build a case. Uh, they're very important. Um, they are cited throughout uh, our country's history and, you know, big uh, cases in the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, it's they're very influential, um, but they're not enough to, to push everything over um, the line. And essentially what what is required is to get everyone on board to ratify the Constitution is this Bill of Rights. Um, so uh, you probably heard of the Bill of Rights before. A lot of people don't know that the Bill of Rights is actually the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Um, they were written by James Madison. Uh, and they list specific prohibitions on government power in response to calls from several states for greater constitutional protection um, for individual liberties. Uh, essentially, um, you know, the, the founders saw the ability to speak and worship freely as a natural right, um, and, and that's why it's the First Amendment, right? Uh, you know, a huge portion of the uh, immigrants who came over to the colonies and, and helped found them and, and establish this country uh, did so out of a search for religious freedom. Um, so th this is very ingrained in our society here. Um, and, and it would be shown as, you know, being the first amendment to the constitution. Um, and really the bill of rights, you know, highlights kind of everyone's concerns about the fact that there aren't all these, you know, uh, there aren't, that there isn't language in the constitution that really protects individual liberties the way that it should be there, according to a lot of people, right? So, uh, for instance, you know, the fourth amendment safeguards citizens rights to be free from a reasonable government intrusions in their homes through the requirement of a warrant. Um, you know, this is because they had just gone through a revolutionary war where King, you know, King George's forces could just go into anyone's home whenever they wanted, um, and, and just kind of take it over. So, uh, you know, it's things like this. You can very easily see the influence of the, you know, last um, decade, you know, plus, you know, the, really the whole founding of the, the colonies up to this point has been heavily influencing these decisions being made by these lawmakers, these delegates. Um, so it's got very strong influence, actually, um, both from English and American uh, law writing at, the, at this point. So we have the Virginia Declaration of Rights written by George Mason as a heavy influence uh, to James Madison in writing this. Um, other precursors, you know, other influences, the Magna Carta from England, the Petition of Right, the English Bill of Rights, and uh, also the Massachusetts Body of Liberties. Um, and one of the many points of contention between Federalists who advocated strong national government and anti-Federalists who wanted power to remain with state and local governments was the Constitution's lack of a Bill of Rights, right? So, so that's what we're talking about here. And, and, and the fact that that Bill of Rights will place specific limits on government power. Federalists argued that Constitution did not need a Bill of Rights because the people in the states kept any powers, right, as we were talking about earlier in that compromise of uh, state versus federal. They're like, anything that's not detailed in the Constitution falls to state, right? But the um, anti-Federalists are very wary, and they say that, no, like, we, we need this Bill of Rights because we need it to safeguard our individual liberties. You know, we don't want the federal government to go around and, and change its mind and or, you know, create new legislation or, or whatever to try to impose itself over, um, you know, the states or, or individual liberties. So the, these are kind of the, you know, the really defining um, features of, of what kind of the Bill of Rights is all about. Um, so Madison, uh, at this point, a member of the U S house of representatives, he attempts to alter the constitution's text where he thinks it's appropriate, but several representatives led by Roger Sherman, uh, object saying that Congress had no authority to change the wording of the constitution. So Madison's changes are all thrown out and instead presented as a list of amendments, 
um, that would follow Article 7. So after he gets his list of amendments, 17 of them are approved by the House. Uh, of these, the Senate, you know, remember we have this two uh, tier uh, Congress, right? We have House of Representatives and the Senate uh, for representation of uh, varying degrees. So uh, Senate approves 12. And then it gets sent to the states for approval. Uh, you know, each individual state has to approve it and they get sent out in August 1789. Um, 10 amendments are approved uh, out of these 12 that are sent out um, or ratified. And Virginia is the final uh, state that f signs off on these 10 uh, and does so on December 15, 1791. Uh, and that's essentially how we get the Bill of Rights. And this Bill of Rights, you know, is enough to convince all of the states that we're kind of holding out that, okay, this Constitution is good. We can ratify this. And so, you know, we get the Constitution ratified with the promise of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights gets enacted a couple of years later. And uh, that is the, you know, strong basis of our government that is really in place to this very day. Um, and, you know, you constantly hear uh, Bill of Rights, Constitution getting brought up in political debate uh, a lot all the time. And, you know, um, it, it's really important to kind of understand where these documents come from, the influence on them, and and why they are what they are. Um, because by understanding them, you understand, you know, the the intent, hopefully, of the founding fathers when they were creating them, and and we can interpret them better. Um, and and that's it for this uh, lecture. Uh, and I appreciate you watching. Thank you.